This old town is steeped in history. Take a look around, it ain't that hard to see. There's nowhere else that I'd rather be than this old town. These old streets hold a future in the past. Where the seeds were sown, and this is where the die was cast. Slower pace in a world that's moving way too fast. This old town, this old town, this old town, and many around like this old town. This old town, this old town, and many. They go back, they go back to generations and it down with any kind of luck they'll take the time to stick around this old town this old town this old town and many around like this old town Welcome back to Leroy Heritage Museum's channel. I'm Matt Carl, and today we're going to start a series called History Q&A in which we talk about some of the questions that you have submitted through our website. And uh, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Josh Sparbaney, for sponsoring this program today. If you'd like to become a sponsor, you can do so through our website on the History Q&A page. There's a sponsor sponsorship button there where you can uh, click on there and do that very easily and it's very inexpensive, but it helps Leroy Heritage Museum preserve the history of southwestern Bradford County. So we've had uh, a handful of questions submitted and uh, so we'll talk about some of those today and uh, I intend for this to be somewhat of a podcast kind of situation and uh, but there'll, there'll be uh, some graphics and pictures and different things that will be on the screen to go along with what we talk about. So it will be slightly different from a podcast, but um, very similar. So the first question that I had came from uh, John, uh, and I'm only going to say first names. But John says, what is the correct spelling and pronunciation? Laquin or Laquin? My grandma taught school there circa 1910. She pronounced it as Laquin. Well, John, your grandmother was correct. It is Laquin. Now, there's lots of disagreement out there over this, and um, some of you listening to this program today probably heard me talk about the correct pronunciation when we are in uh, program settings out in the public. Um, Laquin goes back to the two men who started the town, Watson Barkley and Matt Quinn. And they took... Uh, letters out of both of their last names, L-A from Barclay, and Q-U-I-N out of Quinn, so they just dropped one N out of Quinn, 
put those together and came up with the name Laquan. Now, in order for it to be pronounced the way that some people pronounce it, it would have to be from a French origin, and it is not from a French origin. It's a name purely created by the founders of the town. So you have to think that the the family who created the name of the town would probably be the ones who would know for sure uh, how the name of the town was said. Unfortunately, um, there are still uh, descendants of the family today. Uh, but the one who I talked to before she passed away, who actually lived in Lakewood, um, uh, and was a granddaughter of Watson Barkley, um, is the one who confirmed for me uh, how it, it should be said, although I was saying it correctly apparently before that. Um, the best proof, I think, on, on how it should be said is how the granddaughter of the man who created the name said it. And she said Lakewood. Now, to go along with that, uh, I worked on the uh, Barkley Mountain a History, the book that was published by the Bradford County Historical Society. And going through and listening to uh, audio interviews of people who had lived in Lakewood and hearing them talk, um, you most often hear the, pronunci the pronunciation of Lakewood. You don't hear it any other way. And if you do, I started to notice a pattern where the people who were there in the beginning of the town uh, were the ones who were pronouncing it correctly, pronouncing it as Lakewood. The people that were not pronouncing it correctly or they had a different way of saying it, um, because there are even other different ways than what I've even said here, um, a lot of those people were people who came to the town later on. Um, the town went on from 1902 to about 1932. And so when uh, the initial sawmill operation, the Lakeland Lumber Company, shut down, then the Central Pennsylvania Lumber Company took over. And as time went on, other people came in and were hired in the sawmill, moved to town. And it seems to be that people that moved there uh, later on, uh, especially in the 20s, uh, are the ones who seem to have difficulty with the pronunciation. So my reasoning behind that is that I, I think by that time uh, things were changing quite a bit in town. A lot of the early people um, may have um, been gone uh, because slowly one at a time the different factories shut down and as more and more of the town closed down um, you started to lose those people that knew that information. So over 30 years you certainly had a chance to uh, lose uh, the proper pronunciation uh, because new people were moving to town and uh, they didn't know the the correct way to say it and that just got passed down through the, through generations. That's my um, un, that's I guess my hypothesis if you want to be scientific about it about why <clears throat> the pronunciations are have developed the way that they have. Um, Nevertheless, um, the correct way to say it is Lakewood, and uh, so uh, I try to correct people when possible, but um, it's sometimes uh, difficult to do that. But uh, another name, another name while we're on the topic is uh, the name Barkley, and uh, the name of the mountain, Barkley, is different from the Barkley family that was at Lakewood. The name of the town came from the man who originally bought the mountain in 1794. He lived over in England. He was a Quaker gentleman, and uh, his name happens to be the same as the Barclays from Lakewood, but um, I haven't been able to establish any sort of connection as of yet. The proper spelling is B-A-R-C-L-A-Y. Bar Clay, and um, unfortunately, that seems to be a name that is misspelled quite often. It's not usually mispronounced because there's usually 
it's difficult to mispronounce that name, I guess. But I have seen it spelled in all sorts of unusual ways. Um, and the misspelling usually involves a K instead of a C. Um, the second A sometimes is replaced with an E. Uh, there's all sorts of things going on with the spelling of that. And uh, so the, the proper way is B-A-R-C-L-A-Y. And it's that way in, in both Barclays, whether you're talking about the Barclays at Lakeland or the Barclay that, is, that purchased the mountain originally. Um, that's where that name uh, comes from. And when I was thinking over this topic about spelling of uh, town names in southwestern Radford County, there's really not a lot of other towns in this area that have um, names that are mispronounced. Um, other than the town of Leroy or Leroy, however you want to say that. Um, so just sort of adding this on to this topic of proper pronunciation and spelling, the name Leroy or Leroy uh, is actually a French word. It comes from French words, unlike the name of Lake when in this case, it does derive from uh, the French, and it's two words that mean the king. And uh, the words are pushed together into um, uh, one name in, this, in the English form. So I'm not an expert at French, but my understanding of it is that L-E would, would represent the, and in France, R-O-I would represent king. Um, I'm sure there's people out there that know French uh, much better than I do, but that's my understanding of that. And so that is why in the name uh, of Leroy, first of all, it's properly pronounced Leroy because it's a French word. You're saying the king, Leroy, and the R is capitalized in the middle because it's a second word. So uh, the proper way L-E with a capital R in the middle is the proper way. <clears throat> now, that being said, uh, if I've noticed if I go around and I mention Leroy today in programs, people often look at me and, and wonder where in the world I'm talking about. And then I say Leroy, and all of a sudden they understand what I'm talking about. So um, although there is a proper way to say it, um, I go back and forth myself uh, simply because it's sometimes a pain to try to correct everyone all the time on that. And uh, whether it's worth it or not, I'm not sure. Because if you go back into the early records of the township, uh, back in the early assessment records is where I found this, and you can see a copy of this in the Leroy Heritage Museum exhibits. Um, the first assessment book for Leroy Township is very interesting. Before 1835, there was no Leroy Township, and when the residents of that particular area decided to discuss uh, forming a, a township uh, because they wanted to start their own school district, the first name that had been proposed was the name Union. It was going to be called Union Township. Uh, no one liked that name, however, and so uh, another name was proposed by Ira Crowfoot, and that was the name of Leroy, and supposedly it was a name that he had heard elsewhere um, and really liked the name and had suggested it. And uh, in fact, also, uh, there's a person buried in the Holcomb Cemetery in Leroy named Leroy Holcomb, and he's also a named, uh, his name was given to him by Ira Crowfoot. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting thing. It sounds funny to say Leroy Holcomb in that case, because uh, when it's used for a person's name, um, I've only ever heard it pronounced as Leroy. So anyway, that is uh, some background behind uh, pronunciation. But, but getting back to the assessment book story, um, back in the very beginning of uh, the township, the first assessment book on the cover when the name was first voted and given to the township, the first assessor um, 
and I can't remember. It might, Ira Crowfoot might, might even have been the first assessor. I can't remember right offhand. But on the cover, they wrote Union, and then they crossed it out because the name was changed, and they wrote L-E-R-O-Y with a lowercase r, and so there in the very beginning of the township, it was already spelled wrong. And then in other places, you would see it spelled with an uppercase r. So even right back at the beginning of the township, you could see that no one really knew how they were going to spell the name. So that's that's probably enough on name spellings, but it's an inter interesting piece of history because it comes up all the time, and probably how to pronounce town names is one of the most asked questions that, that I've ever heard of. Um, another thing that came to mind in connection with this question um, is uh, talking about Barclay and why Barclay shut down. And um, it's a thing that I, I try to clarify all the time, and I want to take this opportunity to do it again, because there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding uh, out there as to what happened that caused the town of Barclay uh, and uh, the towns on the mountain in general uh, to shut down. And some of this stems from the Barclay Cemetery, where people go and they look at gravestones and they see that many children died from disease and uh, stories then circulate and um, people then start believing that this town must have died because everyone was killed by a plague or something of that nature. And uh, that's just not true. And it's, it's something that I attempt to correct any time I've uh, tried to, uh, any time I've heard it. Um, Barclay, uh, as many towns in those days, had its share of all sorts of epidemics that, that went on. Uh, you can read about some of them in the book Romance of Old Barclay, which is a very thin book, and uh, it's literally $10. You can get it at Leroy Heritage Museum or at the Bradford County Historical Society. You can order it online, either place. You can read stories in that book of, um, for instance, fathers uh, carrying their dead children in the middle of the night to the Barclay Cemetery and burying them, um, because they had some sort of disease, whatever was going around at the time, and um, then returning back to their home, removing all their clothes and burning the clothes or burying them, whatever, before they could go back into the house. So you can read some of those stories in that book, and those are the real stories. Uh, I've heard so many stories that are not true. Quite honestly, there is enough astonishing information in what actually happened there that there really isn't any need to make up anything. Um, the stories are readily available there in uh, Romance of Old Barclay, and I, I would recommend anyone um, getting that book. It's, it's very short, but there's a lot of information packed right into that on the town of Barclay. It's probably the best resource available uh, on it to date because it was done in the 1920s when there uh, were a lot of people from Barclay still alive, and those people were coming to Barclay reunions on the mountain, and people were sharing their memories and so on. And Staley Clark, who worked for the newspaper in Tawanda at that time, uh, was responsible for corresponding with a lot of these people to get their stories, and uh, he got a lot of this information down. And it's amazing the work that he did to to do that. And uh, so. It wasn't ep epidemics, though, that shut down the town of Barclay. Uh, the town of Barclay was already coming to an end in uh, the late 1880s. And by 1890, um, the contract was already going to be running out soon for the uh, coal with the Erie Railroad, who was the one using it at that time. And... Uh, it was already expected that they probably weren't going to renew their lease because the coal was not running out necessarily, but it was getting to a point where it was not really economical to get to it anymore. But what happened in 1890 is that a major snowstorm that brought five feet of snow fell in Barclay, 
and it shut down the mines. And uh, rather than waiting then for the lease to run out, um, the the mines shut down because they just there was no access to them uh, as a result of the snow, which makes me think how fascinating it probably is down underground uh, in mine tunnels because perhaps there's uh, cars still on tracks and uh, tools left down there but uh, all those all those mines are closed uh, blasted shut or closed in and uh, you wouldn't want to go in there anyway even if it was open because um, coal mines have a nasty habit of caving in um, and the, the ground supports would be long deteriorated which is what caused the sinking in the Barclay Cemetery uh, many years many years ago and of course today it's it's been cleaned up but uh, um, it was that uh, that actually caused Barclay to shut down it was not uh, not people dying as a result of epidemics there were more than one as far as uh, epidemics go because you can read about um, uh, various things in the book that swept through the town. And of course, back then, they didn't have the medicine or the know-how um, to treat the people. Um, we have uh, some things from Dr. Wilcox uh, in the Leroy Heritage Museum, and he was the doctor in Barclay for um, a period of time. And uh, he was... Uh, known as a homeopathic doctor and he relied on natural remedies and so on to treat people and so um, while that was probably effective in some cases in other cases it probably was not effective at all and so uh, that's just how the medical medical field was back in the 1800s so enough on that subject but uh, certainly a lot there uh, to talk about the next question was uh, from Tom and says, My grandmother taught on Barclay Mountain when she was 16 years old. Her name was Ina Gregory. Are there records of her there? She told how she lived with a family there. This would have been 1908. One option for finding out about uh, teachers um, uh, anywhere in Bradford County for that era is uh, to check out the records at the Bradford County Historical Society. The county superintendent of schools kept track of uh, teachers who were teaching in the county at the time in uh, small notebooks. And in those notebooks, you'll find the name of each teacher under each township or borough that they were teaching in. And also, uh, it will have listed along with their name uh, the school that they're teaching and the salary that they were making. Uh, so you would be able to find uh, that much information and uh, determine how long she was a teacher, where she was a teacher, and uh, perhaps how much money she was making at the time. But when I read the name Ina Gregory, it did uh, immediately pop to mind um, her time serving in the Leroy Township School District. I'm going to put on the screen now this uh, picture of her, and she is on the front of a souvenir booklet from 1911 for uh, the Kelly School in Leroy Township. Um, the Kelly School was located east of Leroy. Um, in At some point in time, it was also known as the Crowfoot School, um, but it was down... Uh, near where the Kurt Wright or Curtis Wright crossroad is in Leroy Township. The road, uh, it's it's the road where the county uh, had the bridge torn down across the Tawanda Creek and then, and then abandoned the road. Uh, that's the road that we're talking about. And that bridge was referred to as the Kelly Bridge as well uh, for a period of time. And this is the only record that I... Uh, could think of of her uh, teaching but um, in this case uh, in this booklet there's a number of students listed now these students would have been from uh, within a mile and a half radius of the school uh, this the district rules back then were that you uh, if you lived within a mile and a half of school 
that um, that is where you would attend. So you would walk or you would be transported, if you were lucky, um, with uh, a wagon and um, a driver who would be hired to uh, pick you up. But in most cases, uh, children would walk to school. So the children listed in this souvenir booklet are children who probably lived um, mainly on the north side of the Tawanda Creek, although some names I do recognize as being from the south side. So uh, they probably did come and cross the bridge there to get to the school. And so that is where Ina Gregory apparently was teaching at that time. And uh, that is the only name that I have, uh, or school that I have seen her connected with. But uh, definitely an interesting uh, question. And I, it seems as though I've seen her name other places, but this is the most important one probably. And this was one of the first school souvenir booklets that I ever came across when I started gathering local history. The next question is from Terry, and she said, have you ever thought about doing a walking tour of Canton? For those of, the, of us who have moved away, it would be such a treat to view the town with you telling us the history of the buildings and homes. I love what you've done for the history of the area. God bless. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate that, and I have thought about doing something of that nature with Canton in the past, and I have not come up with something yet. Um, I have s several things that have swirled around in my head that I would like to do in, in relation to Canton, and one is to really get the story of the Canton area into book form, to get the Minicaw Springs Hotel story into book form. I think... Uh, We've uh, gathered more information and, and photographs and everything now uh, than ever before, and um, I feel a responsibility to tell that story. Uh, but the Canton story itself, um, other than the, the booklet done by the Green Free Library back around the, the bicentennial of the country back in the 1970s, and the newsletter booklets that were done by the Canton Area Historical Society, there haven't been uh, a lot of in-depth histories written. Now, I'm talking about uh, histories that were professionally printed. Obviously, there are histories that have been done. Um, Roger Cagle put together a good history based on uh, some of his own writings, but primarily on his mother's writings, Eleanor uh, Cagle, and um, that is excellent information. And the Canton Independent Sentinel did a special uh, issue back in uh, 1950 uh, during an anniversary uh, issue then in which they did comprehensive histories of the town at that time. So there's definitely material. It just, it's just hasn't been widely distributed uh, up to this day. And so that is what I have in mind. I really wanted to uh, tell the story of Minicaw Springs and, and go through all of the um, various ins and outs of it and the stories of the actors and the people that came there. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing story. <clears throat> if you've heard me speak on it before, I've spoken in the Rialto Theater and other places um, on it before. Anyone that's listening, if you've been to any of those programs, you know that it is an amazing story and it, it's something that really needs to be recorded and uh, made available uh, for the future for people to understand. And so that is really what I have in mind. Um, of course, um, a project like that would require some time and would require sponsors to do it. Uh, I've been involved in, I believe, seven, six or seven books so far over the past, I don't know, well, since 2007, um, that was the first one I was involved in. And, uh, of course, we did the one, Im Images of Southwestern Raffer County, that included the Canton area, which was a photo history as well. And all of them, uh, they, all, they all take a lot of time. The last book that I did was um, the book for the Raffer County Historical Society in the History of World War I, Defending Democracy, Raffer County in World War I. And that took a year. Uh, to put together with the help of um, people to, to take care of 
different um, details as far as typing and transcribing and different things that need to be done. Um, so anyway, uh, that's that's what I have in mind for the Canton area. It's just a matter of of getting around to getting another book done. Um, but a uh, walking tour of Canton, um, there actually is a very basic one that was done by Elwin Kai that covers Canton as it would have been in 1912. Uh, we have that at the museum. Um, I'd like to make that <clears throat> available. And, uh, but we'll look in and to seeing what uh, more can be done. If, if nothing else, um, uh, we can put together maybe a video with pictures from around Canton and to talk about it that way. And uh, maybe put together a video for this channel based on that. Um, we certainly have a lot of material that we can cover that way. And so I will keep that in mind uh, for the future. So I think uh, we've been going almost an hour, so I'm going to bring it to a close. That uh, Those are all of the questions that I received uh, up until this point. If you are interested in uh, submitting a question, again, uh, for a future um, history Q&A video, uh, just go to LeroyHeritage.org, click on History Q&A. The button is right there on the front page. And it will take you to a page where you can submit your uh, information, your question there. And um, there's also a place, if you're interested, again, in sponsoring um, the, the History Q&A videos. Uh, it really would mean a lot to us. It's a way of supporting Leroy Heritage Museum. And certainly this year is uh, going to be a rough year for most museums, particularly the volunteer ones especially, because... Um, of what has gone on with the pandemic situation. And uh, so it really makes, it's going to make a difference this year when, uh, if uh, you're able to support um, the Leroy Heritage Museum, it certainly, certainly will help out. Um, it's difficult to uh, uh, raise funds when you're not able to open the museum and uh, not able to do uh, fundraising events because of what's been going on. So we're hoping, the way things are, that at least uh, sometime in the summer we will be able to open up um, and uh, that we will be able to have Barkley Mountain Heritage Day, which is coming up. And uh, just a, a promo for the Barkley Mountain Heritage Day event. Uh, all of the information about this year's event is on our website at uh, LeroyHeritage.org, and the, you just click on... Uh, Barkley Mountain Heritage Day, and then on 2020 event. And all of the information for this year are there. We're still accepting sponsors for that, and all the sponsorship information is there. And we will probably be extending the sponsorship um, time uh, deadline because of what has gone on with the pandemic this year. Uh, so we will we'll give you more time. But um, we certainly thank, we've had several so far that have sponsored prior to when uh, this all went down. But uh, in order to be able to to have everything going on that we have going on and uh, also be able to raise funds for the museum at the same time, we always could um, use more sponsors for the event. And this year we have a lot of things uh, going on and we're pretty excited about what's what's on the schedule one of the biggest things uh, going on this year is uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Woodmobile will be coming. And that's pretty exciting. The Pennsylvania Woodmobile has been, uh, I believe, at the Troy Fair before. and uh, But we'll be having it here um, in beautiful downtown Leroy, Pennsylvania. And if you're not aware of what it is, you can go on uh, online. And there's a link, I believe, on our website on the Barkley Mountain Heritage Day page. And you can also see pictures of it. It's an interactive museum, basically, inside of a 33-foot trailer. And uh, it pulls in and uh, opens up. And you're able to go inside and, and view interactive exhibits about the lumber industry in Pennsylvania. And uh, identify different types of wood and do, do all sorts of things. And it's a pretty, pretty neat thing. Um, we... Uh, 
applied for it two years ago in order to have it this year. So that's why we're we're hoping that everything goes well for having Barkley Mountain Heritage Day. Of course, uh, we will be having um, several other things going on throughout the day. Everyone's favorite Van Wagner will be back um, with entertainment in the afternoon. Um, uh, a program on the history of elk in Pennsylvania. And uh, the Pennsylvania Pro Professional Lumberjack Organization will be coming in the morning. Uh, you don't want to miss that. Um, it, it will definitely be worth coming to see them demonstrate old-time lumbering tools and talk about them and uh, so on. So you don't want to wait until midday to come because you'll miss, miss uh, a lot of things that go on in the morning. And, uh, of course, we have the band there again that we've had in the past. And I will be speaking on what it was like to live on Barkley Mountain uh, through the years, whether it be in the coal mining or the lumbering era. So we're looking forward to that. We have some more exhibitors that are planning to be there uh, than in the past. And, of course, we're still looking for um, people who are um, interested in setting up craft booths or flea market type booths and there's applications online uh, for that as well so if you're interested in that all the information is on there um, and we will definitely uh, be looking for any way possible to make the event happen this year so thank you everyone that has supported that so far um, it has been very successful and it only seems to get more successful each year um, f for an event that brings people from 70 towns across six states uh, all to come to Leroy, Pennsylvania is a pretty amazing thing. And um, we're pretty uh, happy about how that has come together. So that that is our major event coming up this year. And so we're, we're looking forward to that. And again, we'd like to thank our sponsor of this week's history Q&A video, Josh Sparbani. So if you, have, if you have questions to submit for the next time, feel free to submit them. We will try to do these uh, occasionally, just depending on how many questions we receive. And uh, we'll see uh, what kind of topics that uh, we can cover. So thank you again for tuning in to History Q&A. And we'll see you next time. This old town. It's steeped in history Take a look around It ain't that hard to see There's nowhere else That I'd rather be than this whole town